My mother, Joan, has intensely disliked that gospel. You see, by anybody's reckoning, my mother is a doer. And here is Jesus seemingly admonishing Martha for doing in favor of Mary's being. My mother, the practical theologian she is, and summarizing what may be a shared theological judgment by others, often says, well, it's all good and well for Jesus and for most men for that matter, but if we all sat on our backsides and contemplated, how would the work get done? As I've tried to explain to my mother, the story of Martha and Mary is actually a very complex narrative. It can be read on a variety of levels, but two will suffice for now. The first focuses on Mary, who assumes the position of the rabbi's student and is defended against any attack on her right to be there. In first century Palestine, Jewish women were not permitted to be taught the Torah, but only instructed about how they should live the lives in response to its demands. They were not permitted to touch the scriptures, nor to take part in public debate or any official liturgical ritual. Here's Jesus with a woman at his feet, the position of the rabbi student. And not only does he encourage it, he defends a woman's right to be his student, his disciple. And this is the sort of freedom that Jesus envisaged for women. Mary is in fact the symbol against the religious patriarchy of her day. On another level, the story focuses on Martha. The writer of Luke tells us that we're in Martha's home and that she has Jesus as her special guest at table. She is serving the members of her household with care and devotion. Martha comes across as strong and outspoken. Mary, meanwhile, passive and silent. It's likely this story is criticizing a call in Luke's community for women to move away from the leadership Jesus gave them and to adopt again the more traditional roles to which Jewish Christians were more familiar. One of the fine things I find reassuring about today's gospel is the church has been wrestling with women's leadership since the very beginning. It's the issue that won't go away. As you well know, only the week before last, the plenary council got shipwrecked on it halfway through. Thank God, and completely unreported, resolved by week's end, or at least to some good measure. But it won't go away, and nor should it. To this end, today's story, which comes out of the experience of the earliest Christian communities, holds a key to our own dilemma. Just as Jesus broke through the gender boundaries of his own day, so too must we. We must renew our commitment to anything that degrades, exploits, or dehumanizes women throughout the world. It's one thing to defend it in the world. The church has been good on that, and rightly so. It's quite another when we turn the focus to our interior life. And I think we need to take some strong and symbolic steps to defend the leadership of women without our own community. For example, now along with the plenary council, I hope very soon we will readmit women to the ancient order of deacons. For they're highly praised, the women deacons in Romans 16 and 1 Timothy 3. If it was good enough for the early church to have women deacons for centuries, why wouldn't we have women officially baptizing, marrying, conducting funerals, taking communion to the sick, attending at the table? I think we should readmit lay people. Note what I said, readmit lay people, and this time lay women into the College of Cardinals. Most Catholics don't know this, but for the most of the 700 year history of the College of Cardinals, there were lay men with clerics doing the electing of the Bishop of Rome. That the final one died in 1893. So then there was 
abrogated. It was taken off the books in 1917. And finally, it was only bishops who could be in the College of Cardinals in 1960. I want to go back to the older, more ancient tradition in the church and now have lay men back and now lay women back. The lay women and lay men can't be elected the Bishop of Rome, but it would mean they would be there doing the discerning about who should be the Bishop of Rome. Along with Pope Francis, I want to see that women especially take on leadership positions in every place they possibly can in the Roman Curia and every diocesan Curia. Again, the Plenary Council did in fact say that, and they're consulted about the very things of which they're as responsible for the life of the church as we all are. Just this week, for the very first time in the church's history, Pope Francis has appointed three women now to sit on the council who are recommend bishops for him to appoint. It's only a small action, but in the life of the church, it's a powerful sign of where he thinks the Holy Spirit is calling all of us to move, and it's not before time. Closer to home, 75% of the Catholic Church's employees in this country are women. We could not run Catholic education, Catholic health care, Catholic social services, Catholic spirituality, Catholic uh, development aid, and we couldn't run a single parish without women. I couldn't run, I couldn't, we couldn't run this parish without the extraordinary women, many of them here tonight, who give of their time, talent, energy, and leadership. In fact, I think the women of the Catholic Church should go on strike for a week just to remind the blokes who's running this show. Because sometimes bishops and priests, males and clerics, like to think that because they're ordained, they're the leaders. Ordination and leadership are not the same thing. We have never been short of magnificent, stunning women leaders in the church. And if we're going to have the rhetoric of recognizing their genius, we have to have the follow through in making sure they can lead in every way possible. At this Eucharist then, let's recommit ourselves to using in the best possible way for the mission of Christ and the church in the world, the gifts, talents and strengths of over half our Catholic community. As described in today's gospel, may we learn from Jesus and from the earliest church that nothing should stand in the road of women offering their talents and gifts to our community and in their service of the Lord so that they can choose the better part which is never to be taken from them. For the bottom line is this. My mother was wrong about her reading of the gospel. It's not about domestic arrangements. It's about who can be the legitimate, important, valued disciple of Christ. And if it was good enough for Jesus to say, this is Mary, a woman, it should be good enough for all of us. Let's stand and we'll profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into heaven. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 